Hello, I'm Conrad Swift, and welcome to the Cardano Convo podcast, a podcast that gives a glimpse into the Cardano ecosystem. The Cardano Convo provides an easy to digest explanation of the projects that are being built, thoughts, and what's going on within the Cardano community. Today, we'll be learning about the CNFT project and game Crypto Pets with Nick, the CEO, Bob, the story designer and community supervisor, and Jake, the programmer. Without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, everyone. It's nice to have you on the show, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us today and answer a few questions about the work you've been doing with Crypto Pets. Hey, Conward. How are you? Hello. Um, pretty good. So there are a couple of questions that I always ask. To begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourselves, your background, what drew you into crypto in general? Um, yeah, so for myself, um, I'm graduate mechanical engineering from the University of Ottawa. Um, I was pretty much into entrepreneurship and then found myself here in Crypto Pets and started it off with Dominic. And now we're a team of five with Jake, Bob, and Justin on top of Dominic and I. And what, grew me, what brought me to crypto? Um, I'm not too sure, but for sure I had the money was involved, but it was about in about 2018 or so. So yeah, that was probably my main reason, but obviously you, you stay not just for the money, but you stay for, for the tech and everything above that. Uh, yeah, so I started development when I was about 12, so just over half my life now. Uh, and I got right into game development with the iPod Touch making doodle jump replicas. Don't know if you've ever played that. Almost then, certainly. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then in high school, I moved into a bit of a Minecraft phase. But then in college, I met some guys that were into crypto investing. And I went to school for computer science. And we had a project where we had to pick a programming language to learn. And I picked Solidity. So we learned that and we got our feet wet in crypto. Weren't smart enough to make any big time projects yet. We are still young and naive. But uh, once I got out of college, I found I had some free time on my hands. So I really dove in. And then when Cardano got up to speed with smart contracts, I knew I had to hop onto that Plutus Pioneers program. And uh, I'm the lead story developer for the uh, for Crypto Pets. Um, uh, I do, uh, or in, my, in my past, I, I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, uh, and I've been on both sides of the table as player, you know, building upwards of probably 50 at this point backstories for characters and some of them never get played <laughs> classic yeah um, uh, and then on the other side of the table you know world building um uh, plenty of stuff to dive into with that as far as like the npcs um uh, the uh, hierarchies of divinity you know all sorts of interesting things you can dive into and so many things that your players can just destroy right in front of you and uh, waste a lot of your storytelling um, uh, so that being said, uh, it kind of primes you perfectly for developing a new game. Um, uh, we, we do a lot of, uh, a lot of internal conversation with the team and we bring it out to the community. Um, and so I, I, I enjoy the writing and the rewriting process quite a bit. Um, I've been doing it for fun for a long time and now I get to implement it in a professional manner. So Oh, wow. It sounds like a lot of interesting backgrounds have come together for this project. But would you guys be able to give me a quick rundown of what crypto pets are or what it is? Well, crypto pets and crypto pets, the creatures are two separate subjects. So let yes. Nick maybe touch on the uh, overarching concept of crypto pets as the game. And then I'll uh, maybe do a little bit more on the crypto pets themselves. Yeah. So, so crypto pets, the game is basically. We can think about it more of uh, it links to you know you have the nostalgic feeling of that first time you you discovered the, that Pokemon world, um, but the crypto pets as it is that when you own a crypto pet you own a piece of the game you own of the piece of crypto pets itself. So the crypto pets basically um, is going to be. A more of a, a battle simulation, so a strategy game tournament style map RPG um, that will be either three, six, or nine uh, crypto pets versus three, six, or nine crypto pets. So either well, yourself versus an opponent with uh, identical crypto pets. And then I'll let Bob touch on what is more crypto. Yeah. Yeah. So the crypto pets themselves um, are 
you know, energetic, resourceful creatures that exist on a, a planet that we as the community have discovered. Um, uh, you're coming upon an ecosystem um, and uh, these pets exist on a planet that you've come upon and we've all lovingly named Adana. From there, these, these pets, you know, we find that they're in a bit of a struggle on their home world. Um, uh, there seems to have been some sort of a magnetic, maybe navigational issue, uh, and they have found themselves in uh, different ecosystems than uh, they're supposed to be. In. So you're coming to uh, help solve a problem for these pets. Um, uh, and that's how you start to create bonds with them is helping them in their everyday life while you're kind of cast out as an explorer in your own right. Uh, so you meet up in that place and you start to you know, build a very healthy relationship from the ground up. Oh, there's a lot that goes into that. And I do understand the nostalgia feeling and how innate the concept of like a Pokemon S game is because I know a lot of people started with Pokemon. I remember getting my Game Boy Color back in the day. And I started with Pokemon Yellow. So I mean, like, first gen, and then went to second, kind of tapered off from there. But I'm sure we all had our different generations. We either started on, like, the second, third. So that's something we all can very well relate to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I started off with the Gen 1, the black and white, my little uh, Charizard Pokemon one. And it was, the yeah, the red one, the red Game Boy as well. Yeah, on that Game Boy. It was all red doesn't even have the the light uh yeah. right as a oh, yeah. so you're sitting there trying to turn properly yeah. and get the right angle to see what's going on, on the oh screen. yeah and all the awesome. extensions you could you could get the clip for the light because it didn't have yeah. it built. yeah oh yeah, no yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes we could definitely come together on that but what we immediately saw was an opportunity in the story to make it a little bit more uh, of our day i guess i'll say um and because what you run into with that storyline is one where you kind of go around just like stealing Pokemon out of the ecosystem and you put them in a box, right? So um, <laughs> we're, we're working on a game that has a little bit more of an ecological feel to it, a little bit more of a, a helping feel to it. Um, so yeah, you'll be excited to see where that goes. Oh, I imagine. It seems really interesting. And I did want to ask in regards to more of the blockchain, with so many different blockchain pro or platforms out there to build NFT projects on, what made you guys decide on Cardano? Um, well, first, the obvious, uh, you know, the, the obvious answers are like academic research, um, power consumption alone is a, is a huge factor, um, seamless, seamless upgrades. And then uh, I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Jake, I know, I know he has some few points about Cardano. Yeah, so I think there are really two main things that make this project like perfectly suited for Cardano. The first is just the nature of a game like this. You have so many assets. You have the pets, you have tokens, you have countless resources that we're going to introduce to the game for crafting and different operations you can perform with the pets. So when you have an account-based system like Ethereum and you have that many different assets, you end up with this spider web of smart contracts managing the ownership and operations of them. And it just becomes a mess. Bugs are going to be everywhere. It, it just blows up into this crazy thing that you have to manage. But with Cardano and UTXOs, we don't manage ownership of the assets. We just give them to the players. The players have full control at all times, but we also don't sacrifice anything. We can still have the smart contracts to perform the operations. We just don't have to manage ownership. So that really gives us more flexibility in development, but it also gives the players more control over what they own. So it's really a win-win situation for us and the community. And then I guess the main other thing is we're really community focused right now. We're all about feedback, but even more than feedback is governance, right? So Cardano plans, I mean, eventually who knows when it's going to happen, but they're going to roll out Voltaire and it's going to have the protocol level governance. And at that point we can switch from listening to feedback to actually handing the game over to the community. And that's something we're really excited to do to develop the game alongside the community. Oh, it's interesting that you guys intend on kind of following the Cardano method of the governance, allowing the community to kind of shape the game much later on. And that I imagine if it's implemented well, is really going to help with the longevity of the game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because we've seen this, for example, with Skyrim. Once you get like the modding community, you get people building stuff on the game itself. It, it gives it this kind of elixir of e like eternal life, mm -hmm. per se. So... 
a question I did have is how did you guys determine the rarities, the types, et cetera? And how does that affect the price of the pet? Um, so in terms of the, the rarities, there's nothing really, you know, outstanding. Um, and there, there's nothing really, you know, outstanding in terms of like, uh, you know, the big signs behind it. We did do some research. We did look at some old, um, some old projects like space buds, Cardano bits, and really based ourselves off that. And then from there on, we, we just distributed um, just as equally as possible with all the rarity types. Um, that uh, I thought was, you know, ideal for this, uh, for this situation. And for, and in terms of uh, the, the pricing aspect, um, I mean, that's, that's the, 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 the community that, that decide, you know, um, a legendary sold for what, 6,000 not too long ago. And that's wow. just the beginning. So it's crazy. Oh yeah. I'm glad there's, it's again, it seems more of the community gets to decide, like for example, pricing, things of that nature, mm -hmm. but um, I did notice you're talking about legendaries or whatnot, but I noticed these pets don't have names in the future. Will they have names? Cause they're kind of just numbered right now. So as we do, as we do with almost everything, uh, we started in the very beginning by actually bringing it directly to the community. Um, uh, and uh, they, they voiced their opinion pretty quickly that they would like us to implement a naming system. Um, they actually just wanted to hand it off directly to us and have, them, have us just name them out, right? But we, we still wanted to have a little bit of that community hand in there. So there is actually a voting system for the names. Um, I come up with a... Um, a selection of them every update, uh, at least, and it, we switch them out. So at this point, we're up to 60 plus names. Um, and uh, there's, I think the overall number is 150 or so, I believe. Is that correct, Nick? Yep. yep. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, in the course of the next months, uh, it will be completely named. I will then take the least uh, voted for pet names and do their own specific voting process with a new selection of names built out for them. Um, so, and, and actually a lot of the names are community chosen as well. There's definitely some people that have already come, become very attached to their pets yeah. uh, and have claimed a stake over what they think <laughs> they should be called, <laughs> but they, they nailed it. You know, a lot of them have come up with fantastic names. And so we're definitely utilizing those and implementing them directly. Again, I'm glad you guys are, you're pulling constantly from the community. So you're, you have a product you wish to bring. And you're going, okay, we know you guys are wanting this product. We know that you're wanting to be a part of this community. So we want you to be a part of the game making process as well. And that's, again, something I think will help to build your community, like as a, to make it stronger, but also to build it like just quantity wise as well. It's that old adage, you know, if you mm -hmm. run alone, you run fast. If you run together, you run far. Oh, yeah. yeah. So are you envisioning the RPG game to be a web game or a mobile game or a PC game? Where do you en like envision this going? I think our main focus with that is just inclusivity, you know, accessibility. So we don't want you to have to have this high power machine to run our game. Our focus short term is going to be web and mobile. That's easy access, quick access for the most amount of people, anyone who wants to play. As we go further down the road and the game gets more complex, we'll definitely look at a PC option to run directly on your computer. But for now, web and mobile is where we're focusing. Um, I noticed that during the Cardano Summit in Wyoming, Charles mentioned that there will be a dApp store underway. Does CryptoPets plan to be listed there for users or are you guys just going to stick with the more conventional like Google Play Store, Apple Play? Uh, I love the dApp store. So I think it's pretty cool. It's this way where you... You know, new people to the Cardano ecosystem, you can give them a little guidance, a little clarity, a little security in a way, but you're not sacrificing the decentralization. You know, with the Apple App Store, you go to put your app up there, you get accepted or rejected. And if you get rejected, you don't have an app and that's that. But the Dapp Store doesn't do that. You can still have your Dapp. Anyone can launch a Dapp. But now if you're willing to go the extra mile, you can be included in this like aggregated innovation, which I think will really help the Cardano community grow. So I think it's a really cool thing. Yeah. And as you were talking about that, having, I know there's a barrier to entry for a lot of typical app stores. For example, you have to pay a fee to be able to list applications or you have to meet certain criteria or it has to 
it can't have certain factors or it must have other factors. And having a DApp store to where you can put it up there and the community gets to decide which apps are ideal, which ones are best, which ones are highly rated. But yeah, I think it's really cool to have that community feedback there. Could you explain what egg tokens are or could you explain how hatched pets are different from others? Yeah, um, the, the eggs that are going to be hatched, um, uh, those will be providing another layer of exclusivity to, uh, to the game. Um, we haven't officially announced what that layer is. We have uh, some very good plans in place for how to implement that. Um, but it won't be power oriented. So that's the main thing to remember. Um, uh, but ultimately, these pets will be hatched um, uh, during Epoch 2, but they will be of uh, Epoch 1. They will not be Epoch 2 pets, which is also important to note for our community. That sounds like the best mix of things, because the problem is if you make it so that the egg tokens do have an effect on power, then it becomes kind of pay to win in its own method. Whereas mm -hmm. if you are setting it to where, oh, you can get this unique item or this unique pet that it's not going to be a game busting pet, then that just kind of adds to the catch them all kind of feel copyright not included. Um, so uh, yeah, and that's what from, we, sorry. Continue. Uh, uh, yeah. And that's what we really got to be careful with is that, you know, you, you can't overpower something to, to, or, to, to allow someone to automatically win. Okay, I'll buy all the best tokens, I'll buy all the best legendaries or ultra rares, and then I'll event, like I'll win. So we'll have definitely something in the game that's gonna allow anybody to win, like with, with the strategic uh, aspect of things as well. Um, have you guys been working on the Epoch 2 crypto pets or? Uh, we, we did do some brainstorm. Um, we're currently doing some art and getting ready for that. Um, more more details on that later. It's good. This one, Epoch 2 is going to be uh, much better than Epoch 1. There's uh, always an ever-evolving artwork to the, to the, to the game process. Um, we need to always balance how much art we're putting in versus how much development we're putting in. So uh, as the Epochs come, um, uh, we, are, we are planning on increasing that, that level of quality every single time. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's hard to balance some of these things out, which I will go into in a minute. But I did have a question about how does evolution and or adding stat tokens work? Will the pets change on the blockchain or how will that work out? Um, so I'll let the, the blockchain aspect that to Jake. But in terms of evolutions, um, so evolution is going to be a, a focus when the main game is launched. So when the main game launch, you'll be a, you'll have levels and XP. So let's say at level 15, like I'm not saying anything right now, but level 15, um, your pet can evolve. So again, everything that we're, we're saying or we're doing right now is to be discussed with the community to, to get their feedback and to know if this is the right way that they want to do things. So what we had in mind is just, for example, I guess level 15, you have the choice to now evolve it or not. Um, you click yes, you send it to some address, it gets burnt, you get the evolu the evolution. And then that way you keep going with that one at that level 15 all the way until, I don't know, let's say level 50, the second evolution comes in. And from there on, you, the same process repeats, but you have a choice to either to have an evolution or not. If you wanna keep that first evolution all the way up until max level, and it's up to you. And I'll let the blockchain aspect of things in to Jake. Yeah. So, I mean, the game is going to be a lot of things, but at its core, it's play to earn, right? So when people put time into the game, we want that rewarded on chain. So it's going to be a balance between the number of transactions the users have to make and the level of detail that's on chain. And that's something we'll have to kind of play by ear and figure out what works for everyone. But things like evolution, big picture things like that, absolutely, they'll be on chain. In the near term, like Nick was saying, we might have an approach where you send the crypto pet to an address and we handle the burning and minting and the evolution and all that. But as smart contracts develop, we will definitely move it to a decentralized approach where you can send in your pet and it goes through the smart contract essentially and right back to you. So in theory, you have the smart contract to perform the operation, 
but the pet never really leaves your wallet. In the same transaction, you send it through the address and to yourself. So you have full control over the full process as a player. Well, that's amazing because I know I would be worried if I'm having to send an asset through a smart contract or to an address that if it's going to be coming back. But with the smart contract, it can be set that the input and output are input is sent to this address. The output is to send right back. That's the one nice thing about having smart contracts, of course, now that we're in the Gogan era. Yep. And in the case of evolution, the thing you're getting back is going to be way cooler than the thing you send in. <laughs> nice. With many, so many different types in the game, I noticed you guys have a lot of different types for like, for example, Drake, Faye, et cetera. How do you guys plan on balancing that? Because again, that's a lot of types to balance out. Mm-hmm. Um, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, um, uh, that a lot of that is the uh, is the game player and the entire team. Um, uh, I, I mean that in a metaphorical sense. Each one of us is a gamer, uh, and it, when you walk up to something, it, you you start to understand the underpowered, overpowered conversation, especially when you're building it in depth like we are. Um, uh, that being said, the stylings of these types, uh, a lot of these conversations aren't new. You know, ty- conversations about elementals and how they all interact with each other. These conversations aren't necessarily new. Um, uh, and uh, so you can take a lot of that from uh, just your overall gaming knowledge and implement it into the game. Obviously, my Dungeons and Dragons background, it really helps in this scenario because I am very in tune to that sort of thing. But also the home brewing in Dungeons and Dragons is phenomenal. There are thousands and thousands of things that are created by the community every day. And uh, we, uh, we have an appetite for it. There's no lacking of, of creativity amongst the team. That's for dang sure. Oh, no, I imagine, especially with the D&D background, there's a lot you have to kind of plan for it. I imagine, as you said, you play the, D, the DM role quite a bit. And you have to kind of anticipate what the players are going to do because Sometimes they'll want to do something that like really just decimates the plot line or they do something. You're like, wait, what? Like that can be done. Like, OK, like so you're having to kind of think on your feet and adapt to what's going on. So having all this, I imagine you guys will be able to pull that off. Absolutely. You said all the keywords, you know, you, you build, you adapt, you listen. And oftentimes um, with with Dungeons, Dragons, with DMs, you hear the conversation about a or the phrase, um, it's like herding cats. Um, uh, well, we have a community of over 2,000 people, and they're all touching the engineering process of the gameplay. So we've got a lot of cats to herd, but it'll be a good time. Oh, I'm, I imagine so. And before we get to some of the more fun questions, do you guys have any announcements you want to do? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are uh, announcing our token pre-sale for the 14th of October at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So there will be 10,000 attribute tokens and 5,000 ability slash special attack tokens to be sold. So basically, we're, we'll, we'll be running two separate vending machines. So let's say um, you have enough attribute tokens, well, you can go ahead and take some uh, special attack slash ability tokens um, if you wanted to. Yeah, and, and again, so for token-wise, uh, what we envisioned is that so pre-sale is it's really up to you, uh, up to the community members. Like if you want to get tokens ahead of time and get that edge over the year, your competitors on day one, then all the power to you. But you can also wait and when and play the game and earn it through the game, through chess, through um, battles and also um, in the in shop. Uh, game as well but the the in shop um the shop inside the game the pricing is going to be higher because it's not um, in the pre-sale oh yeah so get that incentive so that people mm-hmm. will participate oh of course and i'm we'll be having the links of course to all these things down below for everyone to see so if you're wanting to be a part of that pre-sale check out the links down below and check it out but I wanted to ask a couple of more fun questions so we got, we can kind of get to know you guys. So the first one is, are you more of a Pokemon or a Digimon fan? I say Digimon for storyline and uh, Pokemon for fluidity of gameplay. Um, uh, I think the, the Digimon version of Digivolution is a little bit clunky. 
um, and having to listen to the, you know, little whistling noise every single dang old time. And, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, um, so that's my two cents. Uh, for myself, I would say Pokemon. Uh, I, I grew up with it. Um, I, I traded those cards. I spend my dad's money a lot on those cards. Um, but I did also like Digimon. So definitely uh, both of them. But my favorite is, uh, is Pokemon. Yeah, that's an easy choice for me. Pokemon all the way. I never really got into Digimon, but Pokemon, I mean, yeah, I have a card collection downstairs. Also played Pokemon Red on the Game Boy Color. And even like a year ago, I was still playing a little Pokemon Go. So <laughs> yeah. it, it's been with me my whole life. It's worth throwing into that. Um, uh, I, I mean, I play Magic the Gathering as well. So that's same. That would be my card game. Of, of I choice. must ask on that topic. Do you play Commander? Is that like your go to uh, format? Heck or? Yeah. Yeah. With five of your best buds sitting at a table for five hours. Uh, yeah. yeah. Who is what is your favorite Pokemon? Uh, my favorite Pokemon is uh, Growlithe, um, uh, but, you know, Arcanine's red, too, but Growlithe's my homie. For myself, it's uh, Charizard, just because I have uh, my only card left is a Charizard. It's not a first gen, though, but Oof. It, it is one of those, one of those shiny ones. It's so cool. Yeah, I'm Psyduck all the way. He's glorious. <laughs> nice. A lot yeah. of gen ones. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the last question being, what is your favorite Pokemon generation? But I think I've got, I've got a few guesses. <laughs> one. <laughs> nice. One and two, actually. I, 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 I grew up in that time for one and two, but one is, is, is my favorite. <laughs> oh, no. So I'm in the same category. One to two are mine. And after three, it kind of tapered off a bit. Yeah. Once yeah. Executor got a long neck, I was like, listen, guys, you jumped the shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this has been extremely informative and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to chat today. But before we go, how can listeners get involved with what you're doing or how can people best support you and your team? Uh, Twitter, CryptoPets underscore CNFT. And if you guys, well, hopefully you guys can join the Discord as well, because that's where we get some uh, exclusive information before uh, the Twitter posts. And that's where we, we really listen to you. This is where your word matters. If you have any feedback, do we have an imp um, improvement proposal channel? You just leave it in there and then we, we cycle through them every week. Um, it's really, really uh, where we we interact with the community as our discord and Twitter is more of a, you know, mainstream, um, get people in. And of course we will have all these links down below. We'll have the discord, the Twitters, their website. So check that out. If you guys want to get involved with what seems to be the Pokemon of Cardano, then you'll want to be checking out this project for sure. But thank you guys once again for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure and I'm really interested to see where your project goes from this point on. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Conrad. Yep. Thanks for having us on. Yep. It's been great. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Cardano Convo podcast. If you want an easy way to help us out, make sure to share this podcast. That way we can grow and create a better podcast for you guys. Also leave us a five-star review. And if you had feedback on today's episode, tweet us at Cardano Convo. Send your emails to cardanoconvo at gmail.com or join the Cardano Convo Discord server and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Also make sure to check out our new podcast website on crypto-loops.com. We'd also like to thank our sponsors. First are our Patreons over on the Cardano Convo Patreon page. Their direct contributions help to make this podcast possible. By becoming a Patreon, you gain amazing benefits such as access to polls, to help decide the content of upcoming episodes, early access to videos, roles and benefits within the Discord server, and so much more. Our second sponsor is Loops Pool. If you want to help out the podcast and are looking for a Cardano stake pool to delegate your ADA to, then think about delegating with Loops Pool. That's Loops, L-O-O-P-S. Again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Cardano Convo.